While other participants are still joining us, I'd like to welcome everybody already to our event, Grief and Rage, Every Life Counts with Jamila Ribeiro and Vanessa Thompson. This event is hosted in the context of lecture series, Troubling Psyches, Effects and Struggles in the Pandemic, a cooperation between Medical International, I'm sorry, excuse me, between Medical International, the Institute for Human Geography at the Goethe University of Frankfurt, and the Institute for Sozialforschung, or EFS. My name is Anne Poppinger. I'm a managing board member of EFS, and I am going to guide you through today's event. Just like the other events in this lecture series, this one too is going to be translated into three languages, German, English, and Spanish simultaneously. Enterprise, a collective from Leipzig, supports us with that, and they will now present their work and say a few words about their technical setup. Enterprise is a collective of people with inter interpreting experience from Leipzig. It is our goal to support groups and initiatives that oppose political, social, or cultural power structures by relieving them from the interpreting tasks at events. We also want to raise awareness about the importance of interpreting languages, not only a tool for communication, but inherently political, because it creates reality. Language reflects and reproduces power structures it creates or overcomes barriers, depending on how we use it. How we speak has an influence on what we say and particularly how it is understood by others. Language is power. Only those who are listened to or looked at and those who can understand what the exchange is about can participate in society on an equal footing. Through interpreting, we want to enable people to ex express themselves whenever they would usually not be seen or heard and to react where otherwise their right to take part would be neglected. We also want to put a face on language mediation to be present as an initiative with a political objective. Interpretation is not a service provided by machines. To everybody who wants to contribute today um, while speaking, you, you will be able to um, speak over the floor, if not by the via the moderation. And please uh, make sure you speak slowly and clearly. Thank you so much from my side. Thank you very much to you. I'd also like to underline once more how important your work is, especially if we talk about um, power structures global, from a global perspective, like today. This lecture series explores different perspectives of global politics of affect and psychosocial struggles in pandemic times. This is the third evening normally, but since the first event had to be postponed, it is the second one. So um, we are we're discussing in those six evenings that we have planned the effect political consequences and the question of solidarity in the pandemic crisis. We therefore ask who becomes visible, who becomes invisible, which effects result from that, and how can the pandemic experience that we are dependent on each other globally result in new ways of life and relations? In our last event, Koketsu Moeti and Tobias Natsen discussed the question how solidarity can be enforced in the digital world. The world whose algorithms, especially during the pandemic, cause politics of effect full of resentment, like hatred, irrationality, and loneliness. Today's event is going to be about grief and rage, two effects that both have arisen from the unequal experience of vulnerability. Because the pandemic showed us that people whose lives are subject to precarious conditions are killed a lot more um, by the virus and suffer a lot more from the psychosocial and material consequences of the crisis than those whose existences are vastly secured. Precarious work, limited living conditions, or bad local health care are factors to that just like the uneven distribution of vaccine pat patterns between the global south and the global north. Behind those, intersectional inequalities are to be found, especially along the categories of gender, class, race, but also age and sexuality, and they are what today's event is about. 
because with the extreme inequality, the hierarchization of lives and their grievability becomes more visible. How are experienced losses and inequalities dealt with and what ways of and what ways of dealing with them would be necessary to overcome the intersectional hierarchization of lives? There are, these are the questions that we are going to discuss today with Vanessa Thompson and Jamila Ribeiro. Before presenting today's speakers, I'd like to mention the chat. We are looking forward to your chat contributions to the discussion. My colleagues, um, Mirko Broll and also my colleagues, my colleague Miriam Schröder, they will collect all your questions and comments and will include them in the discussion. You can participate in that via the Q&A button and via the chat. We are glad, and especially me, because I'm moderating tonight's event, that Jamila and Vanessa agreed to join us tonight. In their work, both connect scientific implications and activists, as well as social political interventions, and look at local perspectives against the background of global dynamics. Jamila Ribeiro is a writer, philosopher, and feminist. Currently, she is guest professor for journalism at the Pontifical Catholic University of Sao Paulo and fellow at the Johannes Gutenberg University Mainz. In 2016, she was appointed Sao Paulo's Vice Secretary for Human Rights. Jamila writes for the newspaper Folha de Sao Paulo, the El Magazine Brazil, and she wrote and published many articles and monographs on anti-racism, colonialism, and black feminism. Her work was honored, among others, with the Dutch Prince Claus Award and the BET Award. Vanessa Eileen Thompson is a research assistant in comparative cultural and social anthropology at the U European University, Viadrina Frankfurt. Now she changed to the other Frankfurt. Um, and she was she was she studied in Frankfurt Main, but now is living in Frankfurt Oda, where she is the research assistant as well. Um, in her research and teaching, she focuses on critical racism and migration studies, black studies, intersectional inequality, and gender studies. She um, likes to connect the research, research, her research with her politics and with the struggles of people affected by race police violence. Thank you for being here. We're very much looking forward to your inputs. We asked you to answer two questions. The first question is, um, is um, along which lines does the life in pandemic uh, is, uh, is the life in, pandemics hier in the pandemic hierarchized? And the second question is um, which social political dynamics um, arise from this hierarchization? Jamila, word is yours. I'm looking forward to your input. Thank you so much, Almut. I am very glad to be here again. Uh, I'd like to greet Professor Vanessa Thompson. I had the opportunity to meet her in 2018, and it was a great opportunity when I participated of the Angela Davis lecture series. So I'm glad to be here with you again. Uh, I'm going to read uh, my answer as English is not my mother tongue. I speak Portuguese, so I'm going to read because it's better for me. Uh, so I really like this question if you, because it bears a lot of relation to the work I've been doing. In 2017, I published the book Lugar de Fala, Place of Speech, in which I discuss, based on Black feminists from the South, from the Global South, as well as Black feminists from the uh, global North, this issue of hierarchy of lives. 
from a notion from a notion of social locus that is the social place where individuals and groups meet we can observe how their intellectual productions voices existences etc will be treated in the pandemic the scenario in brazil reaffirmed a structure historically constructed to discriminate social groups based on race, class, gender, sexuality, as well as colonial marks of conformity with global geopolitical arrangements. But first, I needed to put Brazil in context. We are talking about a country with the largest black population outside Africa, with more than 54% of the population self-declared as black, being the place where most enslaved Africans landed. Brazil was the last country in the America to abolish slavery, slavery after 308 eight years in which the black population was the basis of the economy. The first constitution in Brazil, the 1824 uh, constitution prohibited black people from studying. And in 1850, a law prohibit, prohibited them from buying land. It's important to say that at the same historical time, the encouragement of the arrival of European immigrants began. Italians, Spanish, Germans, Germans, etc. Uh, there is a large German community in the south of Brazil uh, who were given land from the Brazilian government. Even after abolishing, abolishing, there was no policy to include black people. During the 20th century, this exclusion system was only updated with the adoption of policies of criminalization of black men, forced sterilization of black women, among other measures that became known as part of the official whitening policy. For black women, the fate of domestic employment was set, occupied before the pandemic by more than 6 million predominantly black women. So going back to the beginning of the speech, the pandemic only deepened the exclusion scenario. Official data showed that in the last quarter of the last year, an increase in unemployment of 8 million people, of which more than 70% are Black. We are talking about a population that was red poor and became even more impoverished, making the situation of these social groups even more precarious. But it is important to bring the gender marker to further deepen our reflection. Anyone who turned on the television to watch the news saw black women in the food donation lines under the sun with children on their laps with nowhere to leave them. Classes were suspended and many families depended on the children to eat at school. In the domestic environment, violence increased. Brazil is one of the leading countries in feminicide. But in 2020, there was still a 7% seven, a seven increase, 7 increase in the rate, according to data from the Brazilian Yearbook of Public Security, of which 66% are Black. The survey also found that every eight minutes, a woman, female child or teenager or female teenager is raped in the country. 
On the other hand, we are under the government, we are under administration whose serious problems are common knowledge. But the situation gets even worse if you take a closer look. In the midst of this scenario, the government eradicated public policies to combat violence against women, such as reception and social assistance networks. Bolsa Família, the largest cash transfer program in the world, was discontinued so that it could change its name and adopt uncertain criteria that have not yet been implemented. As regards health, public health, the poorest people who in Brazil are mostly black have difficult accessing the health system, whether to, uh, to overcrowding or even the lack of material conditions to go to the hospital. Not to mention the lack of access to medicines adequate food and so on, or even access to the vaccine. Since the age criteria from oldest to youngest meant that mass vaccination of white elder people who live up to 20 years longer than black elderly people from extremely vulnerable neighborhoods. What does that mean? Well, a survey by Rede Nossa, Nossa São Paulo Map of Inequality identified that Black people died twice as often as white people in the largest municipality in Latin America, São Paulo. So it's fair to say that lives are being year exit in times of the pandemic but not only in these times. I think it's very important to refuse this idea of Brazil as a racial paradise, or this idea that, this romantic idea that in Brazil there is no this kind of issues, that Brazil is a very nice place that everybody lives in a harmonic way. So, and this idea of racial democracy uh, that was established in Brazil was very damaged to raise a readiness on blackness. That's why in Brazil there, there are still a lot of black people that don't see themselves as black, for example. So it was a very sophisticated idea to not create public policies to face racism because the, the, the idea in Brazil was, if there is no racism, why are you going to think emancipatory solutions for a problem that does not exist? So the black movements in Brazil were very important to face this idea of racial democracy. Today in Brazil, people, you know, I, yes, in general, we will not say that there is no racism in Brazil, but how this racial democracy idea was fundamental to legitimate the, this hierarchy of lives. Because at the same time that Brazil was a very racist country, this country was not developing public policies to face racism. So the affirmative actions policies in Brazil are very you know, uh, new in Brazil. It's about 20 years ago. So yes, in Brazil, it's, uh, we are facing a very difficult reality now. We are under a very conservative administration, but it's very important to understand our context as a country. Yes, this time we are crazy now, but it is important to say how historically this country was, um, was very, you know, intelligent, as Kabenge Lemunanga say, Kabenge Lemunanga, who is a very important intellectual, used to say how this country was very intelligent and sophisticated to, to not 
um, raise awareness on these issues and to make the people believe that this problem was not a problem of Brazil, that this problem was a problem of the United States or South Africa, for example. So that's why I think it's important to value the work of the Black movement and the Black intellectuals in Brazil, also indigenous movement, because there is no possible to talk about racism in Brazil without, without talking about indigenous people, how these people were important to face this idea of uh, non-racist country and to face the hierarchization of lives in Brazil. Vielen Dank, Jamila. Wir werden gleich ähm, noch Zeit Jamila. haben, ähm, Thank you very much, deine Input zu We will have a lot of time to discuss your input later on, together with Vanessa. Oh, sorry, do I need to answer the second question now or no? Ah, okay, sorry. I thought it was only the first question. Okay, are you answer the second one? Because I wrote that. <laughs> sorry. No problem. Um, Yes, which are the social psychological dynamics, grief, anger, despair arising from this hierarchization? Um, I think we need to discuss the, the, psychology, the psychological damage caused by colonialism. I think the, uh, there are today in Brazil, not today, but historically important intellectuals to, uh, who were very important in discuss this dynamic of psychological damage. However, in addition to what we have already discussed here about how the lives of black people became even more precarious given the social isolation in the pandemic, we are led to use social networks even more. Of course, in this time, it was very difficult, especially for um, students from public schools in Brazil to have access to internet. We are talking a country that um, half of the population do not have access to internet. So in this time, it was very difficult, especially for uh, students from public schools in Brazil. But that being said, uh, given the social isolation, we are led to use more social networks cultural events, live streams, or even academic events like the one we are doing now have multiplied. So we needed to ask ourselves about the anger, despair, low self-esteem that is heightened in this very hard time of pandemic by the use of social networks. And also how it impacts people of all ages, including young people. And I decided to talk about a very particular case here in Brazil, if you allow me to do that, how um, we are involved now in Brazil in the discussion about the damage caused by social media platforms. Um, so I'd like to tell a case about this. Last year, a 10 year old girl was raped by her uncle and got pregnant. Again, we are in a country where every eight minutes a girl, teenager, or woman is raped, the vast majority of whom are Black. In this case, according to Brazilian law, the girl had the right to a legal abortion because the, the abortion in Brazil is criminalized, uh, it, not in case of rape, no, it's not a crime, but the other rest, it's a crime to do an abortion in Brazil. But in this case, uh, the girl had the right to a legal abortion. Uh, however, after repercussions on social media, uh, hysteria developed on social media about the matter, especially after a far right activist disclosed the name and address of the hospital where the girl was on her Twitter account. The Minister of Family and Human Rights, a position created in this current administration, Bolsonaro administration, 
mobilized the public sector to constrain the girl and her grandmother not to go, not to go on with the procedure. The case it took gigantic proportions and a horde of people went to the hospital door to shout at nurses and doctors who were there. Mind you, this, dur this during the time of the pandemic peak. I was shocked by that. The question was, why did the social network allow that message, which is a crime against, child against children under Brazilian law, to take on such massive proportions? The message that exposed the child's name only went off, only went off the air days later and through a court decision. On YouTube, the same person started to make live videos reflecting the case. I took that case in a representation against Twitter that was a red moving after my daughter was the victim of, of threats because of the unbridled hatred of that network. So people, at least in Brazil, spend all day on the social media, on their cell phones. And we need to denounce the way these networks are contaminated by the accusation of people and make users sick. This case demonstrates how black people in Brazil and part particularly black women are regularly dehumanized on social media platforms, billionaire, which are billionaire companies. Indeed, Luis Valerio Trindade, a Brazilian researcher at the University of Southampton, recently found that black women make up 81% of victims of online racism on Brazilian Facebook. He noted that one of the reasons for this may be resentment at the current trend of upward social mobility amongst Black women in Brazil. On Twitter, Amnesty International's survey found that Black women are the target of 8% of problematic tweets. About this situation, I joined several other organizations, Black organizations in Brazil, to file a complaint against Twitter with the Public Prosecutor's Office. Our legal team, led by Professor Adilson Moreira, pointed to widespread exploitation of racism and misogyny on the platform especially economic exploitation of racism and misogyny. After the lawsuit was filed, we are contacted by the Stop Hate for Profit campaign, headed by ADL and NAACP, with views similar to ours about hate on Twitter. Unless there is a regulation of these spaces, for the protection of Black people in general and Black women in particular, social networks will continue to be a catalyst for the harmful consequences for vulnerable social groups of these hierarchies historically placed in society and amplified in the pandemic. So I decided to talk about um, network platforms uh, because yes, in Brazil, there is a year of lives as I tried to show, I, have, I don't have too much time, but less country in the world to abolish slavery. Um, most of the black population are still living in poverty. In every 23 minutes, a young black man is killed, victim by the police violence. Uh, in every eight minutes, a woman is raped in Brazil and most of these women are black. Uh, indigenous people in Brazil are still fighting for the rights of their lands. Yes, this is a very violent country for the others in this colonial concept of the others that try to 
dehumanize it as to take off our humanity. But I think that uh, every time there is an update of these mechanisms. So it's very important to talk today about how the social media companies, platforms, uh, legitimate this hierarchy of lives. Uh, we have to talk about the digital violence because there is not digital, it affects black people in their real lives and how there is this lack of regulation of this company, allow this company to make a lot of money, they profit uh, on hate. So they still earn money, legitimated this kind of hierarchization. A lot of activists in Brazil are victims of attacks in social networks and uh, fake news, the fake news machine in Brazil, it's a huge problem. Uh, Bolsonaro uses fake news all the time in the internet, in his platform. And Bolsonaro was not banned uh, from these platforms. And why not? If he's saying that the vaccine is, you know, it's so crazy in Brazil now, the things that I'm ashamed to, to tell, but Bolsonaro, he says things like, uh, vaccines you make you you know to 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 turn in a alligator. It's crazy. Vaccine is going to make you to be gay. This kind of things, and nothing happens. So he can write that in, on Twitter, and that's it. So Bolsonaro can say to a congresswoman, "I don't rape you because you do not deserve." and nothing happens. So he can say that Quilombola people, people who are descended from the Quilombos, that they are not people, that they are things, and nothing happens. So what is the responsibility of the, the social platforms to allow this kind of, of discourse or to allow attacks against black women, black activists, to allow attacks against feminists, uh, uh, activists in the internet. And people do not understand how they profit on hate. Um, and, and to finish my, my talk, and I think it's very important to, to highlight how in Brazil, there is not a democratic uh, television. We are under a monopoly. Some families control the media in Brazil. There is not a democratic media in Brazil. We are, we are still fighting to have a democratic media. So the medias in Brazil are public concessions being used to attend uh, particular, uh, particular uh, objectives. So, so to attend the, the, the object of the greater entrepreneurs in Brazil. So if you turn on the television today in Brazil, you think you are in Switzerland. You don't think that you are in Brazil. There is lack of black people there, but most of that, there is not different narratives from the narratives of the power. So who controls the media in Brazil? are the men, white men, mostly white men, who are in the institutional politics, who are the, the bankers, who are the men who control our country. And more than that, today in Brazil, some uh, new Pentecostal church own TV channels in Brazil. There is another issue that we, are, we needed to confront today in Brazil. So the second largest, the second largest TV station in Brazil is owned by a bishop, uh, the bishop of the Universal Church. So there is a, a, a power project of this church. They are present in TV, they own TV, and they are in the political, in the institutional politics, they are mayors, congressmen, 
they are in different places of the, the institutional politics in Brazil, and they are very present in the slums in Brazil, in the poor neighborhoods in Brazil. So today in Brazil, the black religion is not candomblé. Uh, the black religions in Brazil are not the black, the, the, the African heritage religions. The black religions in Brazil today is the evangelical, new Pentecostal uh, religion in Brazil. So it's another point that we need to, to, to say, to understand the Brazilian context and how it's difficult to, to think emancipatory solution in this scenario. So now I ended, sorry, I thought we we're going to answer only one question, but I think now I answered it both. Thank you. No problem, no problem at all, Jamila. Jamila. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think the, I think the perspectives the perspective that you showed us just last, um, are going to in the last part uh, of your speech, topic. it's connected very much What's to what we spoke about last event, where we talked about the power of algorithms and who's behind them, pandemics, when we especially in the pandemic, become where more, we have become um, more and more dependent on the communication and on social media and social digital media channels. And now, now I'd like to give the word to, to Vanessa. Um, stage you is have yours. The word and We're looking I have your presentation that I will begin now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Jamila. I'm really happy to be in a discussion with you in particular with this important input that has given us um, closer input in the pandemics and the continuities of um, colonialism, gender in Brazil. And of course, thank you for the invitation to this uh, important uh, lecture series. I'm very happy uh, to be virtually be back in the Frankfurt context. And um, thank you very much Alan, for the great communication and support with relation to the preparation of the panel. But also thank you very much to the Interpreting Collective uh, from Enterprise um, who are interpreting this discussion. I also find it very important, especially if we're speaking about uh, the breaking down of barriers in the creation, improvement of accessibility to academical spaces, uh, language plays a very important role. This also was already said, and, and I believe that we're all doing very well to continue on the on the interpretation to other languages, but also interpretation to sign languages. In my uh, small presentation, I would like to throw out some ideas and also uh, go deeper um, that deal with the hierarchization of life. And this is the first question that um, Anna um, asked, I would like to focus on the question of hierarchization of life in the pandemic, but also further uh, to sematize it. And I would like to um, work on this hierarchization of life and, and the um, link it to, the, to breathing. Um, I'm especially linking in this analysis uh, to the works of Franz Fanon but it will also try to show why it's fundamental to bring his analysis into conversation with feminists and especially black feminist perspectives in order to enrich it. And then argues in this analysis of colonialism, and in this particular, he refers to the colonialism in Algeria, but not uh, only, that the productions of political rationalities of colonial uh, capitalism operate differentially and run along the social production of colonial difference. For instance, Panon shows the exploitation of the colonial situation does not simply operate through the abstraction of labor, 
but also through the social production of difference. In the sense of Black radical tradition of Cedric Robinson um, calls in his well-known work, Black Marxism, Fanon argues that not only the wealth of Europe, but also enabling of wage labor relations, so of free and the same unfree labor, depends on racialized overexploitation on the plantation and in the colonies. For Fanon, uh, this affects uh, questions of violence, police. So the, so the colonial situation in the metropole is connected to the situations in the colonies. For Fanon, this connects very well to the questions of violence, police, processes of subjectification, dynamics of appeal, but also a uh, question of power. So he writes, for instance, the police in the colonial world is always violent and is impossible to separate from the military. He writes in one of his very important works, The Wretched of the Earth, the colonial world is the world cut into. The dividing line, the frontiers are shown by barracks and police station. In the colonies, it is the policeman and the soldier who are the official institute go between us, the spokesman of the settler and his rule of oppression. In capital societies, the educational system, whether lay or clerical, the structure of moral reflexes handed down from father to son, the exemplary honesty of workers who are given a medal after 50 years of good and loyal service, the affections of springs of harmonious relations and good behaviors, all these aesthetics expressions of respect for the established order serve to create around the exploited person an atmosphere of submission and of inhibition, which lightens, lightens the task of policing considerably. In the capitalist countries, a multitude of moral teachers, counselors, and bewilderers separately exploited from those in power. In the colonial countries, on the contrary, the policeman and the soldier, by, the, by their immediate presence and their frequent and direct action, maintain contact with the native and advise him by means of rifle butts and napalm not to budge. What I find so significant about this passage is that Fanon um, approaches the differential function of policing in particular and has gets a look at the extent to which the state of emergency in everyday condition uh, for certain populations. In this case, violence did not operate primarily through disciplining and self-assignment, but that it directly and abruptly. I am not interested in a linear representation of colonial continuities, but in a contextualization of post-colonial modes of action um, along the interval of histories and uh, ruptures. Here we see that don't take the, they don't take the same forms. Uh, however, I see it's important to, to contextualize that in the racialized um, areas of labor workers, let's say in France or in Portugal, but also in the racialized workers, suburbs of people in Brazil or in USA, police also plays and also exerts a form of um, differential violence. Like we can see a continuity of the question of police violence. 
This means that this historicization of political techniques of violence, we can basically see them in, in, in current forms of violence and their differentiated uh, functions of violence. Currently, Fanon's works uh, in this context um, is especially uh, in the context of the impossibility of breathing. For his analysis of the, the wretched or the damned, and it is important for me to emphasize here for Fanon, uh, it is not the category of identity, but rather a condition. In order to, to describe this condition of the wretched, Fanon uses the metaphor of breathing especially the, the lack or like the impossibility of breathing. He writes, this is also a citation in English. I try to switch a little bit, especially because of the translation. Under these conditions, the individual's breathing is an observed, an occupied breathing. It is a combat breathing. So combat breathing embodies the struggle for breath, the gasping for air, the squeezing of the air supply, the shortest, shortness of breath, the panic attack, the slow disabling of breathing by transgenerational pain, by environmental racism, the rapid death of the asphyxia due to obstruction of the respiratory tract by water during drowning in the Black Mediterranean. Breathing is an elementary form of exchange with and in the world relationally. Breathing is a condition for sociality and for being in contact with the human and non-human world. At the same time, every new breath is a new beginning. In the words of Hannah Arendt, world making. For Fanon breathing or the impossibility of breathing is thus more than a metaphor. It describes a historical and materialistic condition that is inherently interwoven with and produced by racial capitalism. The impossibility of breathing for many reasons and then also names in this well-known saying, when we revolt, it is not because of a particular culture, but because for many reasons, Last year, the impossibility of breathing has been compacted through policing and the impossibility of breathing through
at the global level, there is a danger that um, the vaccine nationalism or the global pharmaceutical industry and property rights will further mobilize health as a vector of a sanitized global coral line to speak with VWB to what? Running through neocolonial geographies. While well, countries of the global south, such as South Africa, are asking for the international community to let them breathe and waive intellectual property rules for COVID vaccines, breathing itself seems to have become a commodity. There is a sad notion of not breathing that I would like to link in order to speak about the hierarchization of life. Because I believe Fanon's analysis helps us to understand this hierarchization. So it's the third concept of not breathing or breathlessness um, linked to the first two, the imprisonment or carcerality and the racist capitalist politics of the pandemic, namely the breathing of the environment of the earth in more in one sense of the word. In Fanon, this third form is also implicitly addressed. For Fanon, the condition of the damned, the damned of the earth is also linked to the damning of the earth. Pollution, fossil fuels, and carbon are damning the earth and its climate, not only creating an imbalance, but destroying the relationship between the elements, ecologies, and human and non-human interactions. The oceans and the forests have also, are also suffering under deoxidation as, as a result of an anthropogenous uh, carbon deoxidation. This has created death zones in the seas that have a low number of Of carbon dioxide, what is leading, what is suffocating the, the sea. Breathlessness is more than one sense of the word. As it gets hotter, people in many parts of the world, especially along post colonial global geographies of inequality, find it hard to breathe. Droughts, fires, and immense heat are also the effect of worlds struggling to breathe. In addition to the analysis of the impossibility of breathing in more than one sense of the word, Fanon can also be very helpful in another way. Let us leave this European right at the end of Wretched of the Earth. Let us leave this Europe in which they never stop talking about men and yet murder men whenever they find them, on every corner of their own streets in all corners of the world. Europe here does not simply mean a place, but rather refers to a specific colonial and imperial mode of life and relationship production, which has long since been globalized. I understand leaving Europe not as an anti-European project, but a project that resists European ideals and political concepts, which are based on necropolitical exclusions, human rights, liberal democracy, refugee conventions, citizenship, nations, etc., in the direction of new and alternative modes of relations. This is moving in a direction of a new um, mode of production. The crisis that we're currently confronted and our effects of certain hierarchic of our uh, production of the hierarchization of life that are linked to the impossibility of breathing. The expansion of
the all these crisis phenomena cannot be solved through a liberal inclusion, such as the inclusion of the regimes of liberal citizenship, property, etc. Leaving Europe in final sense means breaking with basic political and social categories, economies and relations, and at the same time redressing worlds, redesigning worlds. And what Fanon teaches us in new few things here, he ignores essentials in his analysis when it comes to leaving Europe or even the politics of grieving. Namely, that the imaginary, imaginaries and practices of new worlds and ways of relating have long been tried out on a small scale. At the same time, abolitionist projects and geographies marked by transcendent like small but also big pieces of resistance often self-organized and feminist. If you look at it historically, the Maroons, the Columbus, places where people have left, have resisted slavery and have tried to create new forms of relating, but also revolutions. For example, the Haitian Revolution. It's really important for me to say that none of these projects of resistance wouldn't have existed if there was not a feminist contribution to them, but also without the basis of the possibility in order to create this revolution. Also the, the, the work that's often being made invisible. Today we find resistance and abolitionist projects that try to follow this logic also in the, in the everyday resistances of, for instance, self-organized refugees initiatives and supporters. For instance, Refugees for Refugees or the Migrant Solidarity Network, Women in Exile in Germany and the resistances in camps, but also a resistance against sexual life violence in isolation border regimes for the supports of structures healthcare, well-paid work for everyone, freedom of movement and a dignified life. In this context of not only protests and policing, but practices of care for the criminalized and the imprisoned. Also the context of the resistance of the water risk protectors, climate activists from the global south, who do not address man-made climate change in isolation from colonial continuities. Alternative, they find themselves in their campaigns and protests. For instance, African feminists who in the COVID recovery economic plan try to show the different, had, had tried to build a world a post-colonial world where breathing is horizontally um, horizontally divided or not differentially. You find them in alternative alternative forms of relation between the human and non-human world, an abolitionist council for the world that at the same time does not romanticize care work, but has made invisible, that has been made invisible, but demands it to be shared. Anger, grief, worry and a concern for the world affects and feelings are thereby an essential part of the politics of breathing and living. For instance, the Black Lives Matter movement creates a strong link to love. In the, the love matter to black people uh, that played a big role in the mobilizations of the movement, this, this concept of love had a very important um, part of the whole movement. Konya West brought it to the point by, by saying that justice is what love looks like in public. 
we also see this in memorization politics in archives of memorization that also they also create different forms of relation with the damned who are not simply pre-political but are also located in political struggles and imaginaries of breathing and living. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa. In the end, you also mentioned the alternative ways of relating, but you also mentioned the revolution for life that uh, overcomes the colonial continuities, uh, or at least you named some of them, and I'd like to talk about them later on. But I'd like to start into the discussion with another question. So you, um, from the perspective of colonial continuity, that plays a huge role in both of your uh, works and is connected with the, um, with the dimension of gender as well. You, you spoke about the neocolonial geography, or you say, a sanitary global color line that um, that manifests itself uh, along the lines of health um, property rights or others and I thought it was very interesting how you how you Jamila also mentioned the um, colonial neocolonial demarcation line it is something that is a local logics, but also to be seen globally and not only on a national level. And it is a double logic of, on the one hand, national hierarchization, and on the other hand, it is to be seen on a global scale. So this is why I'd like to ask the question to you, what is your impression? How do people, how do people who are affected by uh, intersectional inequality in the ways you described experience and process these losses and injustices? Uh, yes, um, in Brazil, not only in Brazil, but uh, as black feminists, Afro-Brazilian feminists, we are arguing how we needed to face the problems in an intersectional way. And even in Brazil, it's difficult to people to understand that. Uh, Lélia Gonzalez, Luisa Bairro, very important Afro-Brazilian thinkers, they were pioneer on making these kind of reflections, but still in Brazil, they are not so recognized the way they should be. Uh, when we, I had the opportunity um, four years ago to work in the public administration and also for us as black uh, feminists, inter intersect intersectionality is not only a theoretical concept, it's also a tool to think public policies and how it's, too, it's difficult to, to, to manage this, this, this idea in Brazil. Because when a governor say, says, I, my government is for everybody, who is everybody? So people are, uh, market by oppressions, by identities. But even today in Brazil, even the progressive side, it's a hard conversation and, until today. To understand that, uh, that to talk about race is not a specific thing. To talk about race is to talk about a structure of oppression. So it's not enough only to create public policies like um, uh, a secretary for women or a secretary for black people. Yes, it's important, but it's important to talk about race uh, in the discussions about housing, health, education, because to improve the healthcare system in Brazil is to improve black lives, uh, to improve the, the education system in Brazil is to improve black lives. But still in Brazil, this is a challenge that as black people we needed to face because usually our white people in the power, even the left wing. And sometimes these conversations are not 
so easy. So that, that is a part of the left wing in Brazil that until today argue that the problem in Brazil is a class problem. Yes, yes, it is a class problem, but it's a race and a gender problem as well. It's not possible to think these uh, oppressions in a separate way. We needed to think that as black women, we are the basis of the society because we, we cross the oppressions of race, class and gender. So for us as black women, it's very important to, 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 to talk about intersectionality because it's a way to make us alive. I, I can give an example. Um, there is a law in Brazil, Maria da Penha law, a law that criminalizes the domestic violence in Brazil. When this law completed, completed 10 years in 2015, I guess, an important research was released, the map of violence research. And this research uh, showed to us that in 10 years of Maria da Penha law, there was a decrease of the number of assassination of white women, a decrease of 10%. But in the same time, there was an increase of assassination of black women in 55%. So what this uh, result showed to us that in the time to think this public policy, there was not a race, a race look at. So for black women, it's not only about to say, go to the police station and do a report because most of black women live in poor neighborhoods. Most of these women, they don't trust in the police. It's the same police who is killing their children. Uh, these women, they can't uh, call the police to, to, to go to their neighborhoods because it's a different, um, it's a completely different situation. So it, it, it's a part of the, the, the city that sometimes you cannot call. Most of the, the centers who provide assistance to women in this situation are located in downtown. So in a city like Sao Paulo, which is a huge city, two million people live here. Uh, sometimes these women, they don't have money for public transportation, for example. So it's not only about a legal thing to establish a law and say, well, now the problem is solved. For black women, it's, it's to think beyond the legal, the legal thing. So that's why intersectionality is so important because if you do not name the reality of these women, the this place of uh, speech, this place, this, this reality, these women will continue invisible when the invisibility kills. That's why intersectionality is so important for us, but not only to think about our situation here in Brazil, but as Lélia Gonzalez used to say, to think the geopolitical regimes. Lélia Gonzalez was very critical to what she used to call as um, a dependence, uh, epistemological dependence of the global North. For Lala Gonzalez, it was very important to value what we are doing here in Brazil, in Latin America as well, when she, she created the concept of Americanidade, Americanity, to value the contributions of Black and Indigenous people in Latin America to, to, to establish a transnational struggle here in Latin America and us as people from the global South, from Latin America to embrace ourselves and not just to look up to the global North. It's not about, it's, it's, it's not a matter that, that we cannot learn from the global North, it's not that. But also to look up to our reality here because usually we look up to Latin America in the perspective of absence, only in this perspective. You do not, we do not look up in the perspective of potential, what you have to learn from this, this, this side of the world. So yes, Lela Gonzalez, she was, for example, can, she was very pioneer in this intersectional discussion, 
But as she was reflecting on Brazilian Portuguese, she is not known in the international debate on that, for example. So the politics of translations are also colonial politics. So she was arguing that in the eights in Brazil. Why Lele Gonzalez is not known if she was, you know, contemporary of Angela Davis and different uh, intellectuals. So she was arguing how intersectionality is the only way that you can can be possible to think our reality, even in, in other countries, people from the diaspora, and how it's important to important to, to think about public policy beyond being an important theoretical concept. Thank you very much for your question and also for your explanations. I'd only like to add one thing. So regarding of what do we, uh, how do we process and how do we experience? And I think it's always difficult, uh, different because there are some people who are mul multiply marginalized and those are still not a homogenous group. But what I noticed in the discourse or in the community in communicating with people who are who experience racisms in Global North, but also when I looked at abolitionist networks in South Africa, um, parts of Brazil and West Africa as well. Um, people said that this crisis like this is not, not a new thing. So for many people, it's this new thing how this crisis develops, but for other people, is, it's something that is, has been developing over the crisis hundreds, hundreds of generations of and it has been going on for a while. Look at, and I always like to look, to look at, at how, how people express, express themselves. This, um, um, many if we look at the Matter, Black Lives Matter protests, um, protests uh, in, in Global, in Global South, South or Coast also in the States. United States, there have been sites with um, um, People say Science we're holding up sort of um, a reminder that you that should said forget you haven't Haiti, forgiven Haiti. That we need and to create. I think it's very important to, to underline that the struggle for of black lives has a very suffering long has history. a very long history. And, and here it's the question: for whom is the question the crisis new? It like it's very important being handled to also look and at experiences and the illnesses and epidemies, Ebola. Um, in South Africa, how it's been uh, spoken about that there's that there's a lot of experts, especially because of the necessity to I also find it very interesting like whose experiences what client crisis and what this has to do with the perception and also the positionality of this like global north south um experiences who are definitely post colonially configured but not directly i also just seen the question if this there is direct if we see, can see it as a direct consequence i don't believe this but i could see like should be side information. Um, and I would like to link for the question about po poverty between global north and the south. And like the global north is part of the global south and vice versa. Like questions of geography and understand geography as power, but also as configurations of power, I'm sorry, I didn't answer that directly. And Fanon, Fanon is,
this is this is the question I just saw in the chat, and I thought this would like would uh, work well with the question of locality, and what's the relationship between the global and the local. I believe how it's being experienced, we can see in many different dimensions and practices and of forms of protest in the last years that take directly massive global dimensions in a very interesting way in many different contexts that are directly applied in local context. Jamila also spoke about the case of Brazil in the category and cartography of black um, fights that in many black diasporic contexts, it can be seen that it's not just about the USA, that a lot of people quickly look at the geographies and in this sense there's processes of I'm re I'm currently reading Calvin Spons like the, the, the name says that it's a form of strengthening This is also a form of articulations of, of sadness and um, to like keep something close to you and, and that you create a reference between each other, pictures of people who have been murdered in connection to police violence, racist police violence. Um, connected to the people who have died through environmental problems that's in the process of mourning we stay in a form of relation that has an effect on how we deal with this in this case it's not just about protests nothing that just happens on the street but equally on, about the questions who enables this who works for in relation to, I, I also see care work as activism, like who holds, who organizes, who creates the space, who takes care of the kids, who makes sure that there is a form of safety at the process and hand sanitizers, that people who are wearing masks, that people take care of, uh, of distancing, that there are independent tracing, um, like ways of uh, collecting data for tracing. And also this needs a form of organization and imagination that's not always happens just on the street during the process. And also the support, the support of families. Jamila already spoke about the strategy, strategical way of dealing with the right, with the law, how to politicize communities. And like, not just express that something big will happen, but also of like, of, of st standing together and of different forms of relating. And mourning is not just things that happen openly in the public, but like if someone dies through the corona pandemic, and there's also different forms of transgenerational mourning that lot that happened much more in the past. And we can see that it's always connected to violence that also people can die after this this pain that they feel that one of their relatives has been killed people who have the the initiative of of mourning for Urijalo the um that his mother did die um, of a heart infarct.
and like who does the support work in this form of mourning and that's always very often invisible sorry i spoke for a bit too long here it's uh, very interesting especially the point about the the continuation of violence and that the crisis isn't new and that the crisis is taking place in different contexts the context that we're discussing currently in like the more gendered and colonial that it's more like a permanent state that through the pandemic and the, the, the pandemic, a lot of people say that the pandemic has been a, like the starting point of getting data for this however the structures a lot of places have already been in these crises in these crises and there's another question that that i would like to read out and would like to pass the word on to Mirko. Um, hello everyone. Um, hello from the backstage. Um, I've collected some questions with Miriam Schroeder that are in the chat currently. Now I would like to take two out of them. The first is connected to transnational mourning and the transnational uh, networking and organization. How does how can you connect the wretched of the earth? Is asking if the 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 murders in Hanau have been reported on also in Brazil. This is question directly to Jamila. And would it change anything if people um, in Brazil knew that people in Germany equally die from racist uh, police violence? What type of self? Second question is how can self organization fight against police violence? I don't know if you understood. It's about police and violence and self-organization is, is about that? The question? It's about transnational self-organization, but generally um, organization against police violence. And the first question is if police violence um, with people in Brazil know about races police murder, laces murders in Hanau. Mm. Okay. Well, um, this is a very hard question because um, sometimes uh, people who are victim of this kind of violence do not understand that it's racism that get the war on drugs. Actually, it's a war on black people. Um, in Brazil, there are some TV shows uh, that are very popular in Brazil that for every day, every single day, for hours, four or five hours, there is a spe spectacularization of violence. You know, police going to poor neighborhoods to arrest the bad, the bad, the bad guys, the this criminalization of favelas in Brazil, discriminalization of black people in Brazil are very naturalized. So it, it doesn't mean that um, these people understand the, 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 this, this issue because we are not talking about war on drugs in television or in schools or it's a very, um, almost exclusive group that are doing that. It, it, it is difficult to get in, to, 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 to spread uh, awareness on that in Brazil because the public security in Brazil, I think it's the, one of the main issues that we need to, to, to discuss today in Brazil. 
but we are under a very conservative administration that say that we needed to, you know, arrest people, that we needed to, you know, put the bad guys in jail. And sometimes people do not understand about it. If you go to a poor neighborhood, maybe you find a person there saying that Bolsonaro is right. So it's a very complicated discussion because sometimes people do not understand the relation between the, the these, these subjects. And, and in the other hand, there is the television every day. In the other hand, you know, it's a, uh, but uh, even with all these situations that are very important to groups in Brazil that are doing, that are organizing discussions with the people in favelas, people from favelas discussing this subject with people in favelas. There are a very important movement, especially from uh, the youth, uh, black youth, that organizing themselves to, to talk to people in favelas about these issues. That is not about, it's, it's not because your neighbor is a bad guy. It's not because, you know, your, you, you, you are living this situation. It's not because God wanted that as the new Pentecostal church says in, the, in these areas. It's not because you are not good enough. It's because there is a project of a criminalization of black people. There is a historical project of criminalization of black people. And, and these states, the Brazil state historically tried to avoid us to raise awareness on that. So even with all these situation, again, there is not a democratic media in Brazil. So it's very difficult to, to, to have this kind of discussion in the media. Uh, it's, uh, I don't remember, you know, to have this kind of discussion in a very popular TV show about that. Uh, but I want to point, I think, when George Floyd was murdered, that was a very terrible assassination. It was terrible what happened to George Floyd, of course, in Brazil, that uh, there, there was a lot of commotion on that, a lot of people in Brazil, just to, 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 to people understand how Brazilian people usually are. So a lot of Brazilian people were, were in the social media saying that they were so sorry, white people in Brazil, a lot of people. So it's an absurd assassination of this man and this is, we are very sorrow in all TV shows in Brazil for hours. The, 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 the media coverage was very massive on George Floyd's assassination in Brazil. Uh, but one week before George Floyd was uh, murdered, um, a teenager boy was killed by the police in a, in a favela in Rio de Janeiro. He was in his house inside his house because of the social isolation, because of the pandemic. And the police uh, went to, to, to that community, you know, to, to arrest uh, and to confront the, 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 the drug dealers in that community. And that boy was shot by the police and he, he died, Jean Pedro died inside his house and he was 14 years old, just one week before George Floyd's assassination. When Jean Pedro died, the media coverage was, oh, it was a fatality, and the police guys that are police that are good, it was a mistake, but this, 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 this young man, this teenager was killed just one week before. So when George Floyd was murdered, and again, it was terrible. And here in Brazil, we were very, you know, we did many demonstration on the streets and solidarity to that, for sure. But the same media ignored the death of João Pedro. And the, in the next week, we're saying that the police violence was terrible. So this is the problem of Brazil. They think that racism and police violence is a problem of other countries. But we are in a country that, again, in every 23 minutes, a young, a young black man is killed, victim of the police violence. And on the other hand, if the Brazilian police 
is the police that most kill is the same police that are most um, that most die in Brazil. And the, the people the, the policemen are killing, they come from the same places that the police comes as well. So the state, the Brazilian state actually is financially financing a war between uh, poor people. But people do not understand that in general in Brazil because it's academic discussion or it's a discussion in certain groups in Brazil and you don't have the power to spread this idea. So it's, it's, a, very, it's a very difficult conversation, this conversation in Brazil. And even when PT, the Labour Party was in power in Brazil, and for sure the Labour Party was much better administration, there were important policies that were created during Lula administration and Dilma administration, for sure. But even under Dilma administration, there were increases of incarceration of black people. Even when the left wing was in power in Brazil, there were increases of black people incarcerated. So it's not an easy discussion in Brazil. That's why I think it's so important you needed to support these groups in Brazil that are doing this hard work to raise awareness on that, to fight the, 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 the administration, to that to organize demonstrations and you know trying to make people understand that the criminalization of drugs in Brazil it's the criminalization of black people in Brazil but yes it's not a easy task for sure but that's why I need that's why I think that it's important to other countries to support these groups in Brazil that are doing this incredible work and this hard work to raise awareness on that. May I just add something? Because I think the question, Julia's question is very important. I don't know what it's like in Brazil, um, if there was, um, if there was reporting on the murders of Hanau or not. I'd like yeah, to look the at the question, question how national about the um, boundaries inside of Europe. That how, like how, how there are anything um, about within Europe Floyd people know Jallo, that's like the name of George Floyd, this, but not the name of Uri Jallo. And like in this the, is of course a problem of mediatization. The, media, the, the murders in, in the US Europe, and this is or like the US, uh, there's focusing a focus of in the, the US area. and you could call but it US empire maybe. So this is why, why I'd like important to, to underline how important it is this, to like who is the George that, George that the movements and who is the um, of publish France. what's important and and I also believe that it needs a more of a horizontal relation in relation to how do we build these forms of resistance and fight. And I also believe this is also the question about organizing of opportunities. I've also asked myself the purchase of BLM, and I'm not talking about the right world of BLM, but about, I mean, there were different initiatives and different groups that before weren't active. We see for the first time since a very long period of time that within anti-racism, that anti-racism has taken such a big dimension on a global level. Like you had protests in different Latin American countries in West Africa, also in the Caribbean. I've also asked myself, how can a post-colonial internationalism see, uh, look like um, along the lines of questions of securitization and criminalization. As you've already said, Jimmy, that this, if you're speaking about the war on terror or the war on drugs, we have a strong racifying logic 
especially if we're dealing about poorer racialized black groups to, to control them and securitize them. And I believe like to connect to this is a really important question, especially if we're dealing with the questions of resistance in the 21st century, because I believe abolitionists also make it clear that there isn't just a, that we're just not speaking about labor in this sense, that many young people that also spoke uh, to in terms of organizing, this is the first thing that they that they experience, like the criminalization with the police, and that's that's why I find it so surprising, especially from youth protests, that the police is such a form of crystallization for all of resistance movements and protests. And I also. Thanks a lot to both of you. I find it really difficult. I would like to lead the discussions more toward the end. Ein Moment, Entschuldigung. Um, und uh, Vanessa, du hattest Vanessa, gerade just that das schon gesagt. And Vanessa, you um, already told us that. that um, Entschuldigt, ich stoppe. Because I have a problem with the translation. So there was a problem with translation. So I'm very sad to stop this discussion. I'd like to create, um, give like a small and last I'd round. Like to close with one uh, and to speak last about point that I wanted that I want uh, to talk about, maybe about the solidarity that to counter the, li the like hierarchization of life today and what practices do we need to be able to do that? You Vanessa, already you already told us about the transnational um, moments mm, of moments of translation of or translation, the transnational I practice. also would like to ask and both of you for a final word. So maybe I'd like to um, open the last round for we, both of you for, for some last words before we stop this event for today. Yeah, I think it's uh, the language again. Uh, I always say that I, I publish um, black authors in Brazil, male and female. We have already published 14 books. For us, it's very important to, to, to publish authors from different regions of Brazil because Brazil is a huge country. So if you go to the north, it's a Brazil. If you go to the north, it's a completely different Brazil. And usually in Brazil, we, we only value what, uh, usually the thinkers that lives in the southwest, for example. Uh, there is this reproduction of this colonial view inside the Brazil. Uh, and it's very important to know these authors and intellectuals from different parts of Brazil, as again, we are talking about a huge country. But as a publisher, for me, it's very important to, to do that, but also to translate people from the global south. Next year, we are going to, to publish books written by Indians, feminists, Dalit feminists. And also we are going to publish books from uh, women from Caribbean. So, because for me as a Afro-Brazilian uh, writer and publisher, it's, it's very important to have access to this kind of thought. And, and also this is about solidarity because I'm here struggling with my English, but I'm only here because I'm able to speak in English. 
And sometimes, and in Brazil, to, to learn a different language, it means that you need to have money to do that. Because we are not, we do not learn English or Spanish as a second language in the schools in Brazil. It's ridiculous. So only the middle class or the high class can, can, can afford to learn a different language. And we are in Brazil and we are in Latin America and we are the only country who speak Portuguese because other countries are speak Spanish. There's another damage of colonization because sometimes we're not able to communicate with, with feminists who lives in Uruguay or who lives in Argentina, for example, because it's a, it's a different language. And sometimes people think that Spanish and Portuguese are similar, but they are so different. And sometimes you cannot be able to communicate. So that's why this kind of network is very important. And the language is a very important thing that we need to, to take care of because we, sometimes you can live uh, besides important thinkers and activists because they don't speak the language, they don't speak English, for example. So that's why in this project, this editorial project that I run, for me it's important to translate to inter to make international the project, not only my books. So um, until today, five of our, our authors were translated to French because it's important to me to make these authors also visible in other languages. So I think it is kind of solidarities are important because to, to, it's important to have the opportunity to exchange knowledge. It's important to, to have the opportunity to, to actually build a network and the language for me, it's, it's a very important thing that you needed to, to, to think about and to, Yes, and to end, I think um, to that were in Brazil important uh, solidarity networks uh, that were in Latin America. Sorry, like the the Latin America organization of feminists uh, in 1985. There was a very important meeting here in São Paulo uh, with. Uh, feminists from Latin America. I think we needed also to know this history because it's not a new thing. I think the feminists before us, they tried to, 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 to create this kind of network. And I think we needed to rebuild that. I think it's important, not only here in Latin America, but with feminists in the United States, in Europe, in German in general, how it's important to rebuild that. And, and to really end now, I am from Candomblé, which is an Afro-Brazilian religion in Brazil. Uh, and um, most of the black feminists in Brazil reflect on Candomblé. And that is a Orisha in Candomblé, the first Orisha, uh, who is a shoe, who is the, the Orisha of the crossroad, the Orisha of communication, and the Orisha of the trade. So for us, it's important to really change, to really exchange as a shoe, Peter's. Because if I give it to you, a shoe says, if I give it to you and you don't give me back, you are stealing from me. And this is the logic of the colonial, to steal, to, to impose, to not change, to not exchange, because I'm better than you, no, I'm going to impose to you. And it's very important to us as, um, both colonial thinkers not to uh, reproduce this kind of knowledge. So when I go to the United States and I had the opportunity to go several times to the United States to, to hold talks there, I always say that for my sister in the United States. Yes, in Brazil, we translated you. Now you have to translate us here in the United States as well. We are reading you, you are using as reference in our course because I teach in universities. Uh, I was part of the group who decided to translate Angela Davis in Brazil in 2016. Uh, so it's important to you that United States, especially you that are professor in great universities to also to translate the Brazilian thinkers, the 
thinkers from Uruguay, from Latin America and Caribbean as well. We need to exchange, we cannot reproduce this logic. So I think, it, I think it's very important also to use what Candomblé, what the Orishas teach us in the way to spread the solidarity and really rebuild these networks, because it's a way also to rebuild our humanity, to restitute our humanity as Black people in diaspora. So I think the language, it's a barrier that we need to, to confront to be able to rebuild this, this solidarity. And Vanessa, again, thank you so much. It was great to be here today. I had some problem with the translation. I don't know if my answers were what you were expecting. I had some uh, problems with the translation, but again, it was amazing to be here. And especially now that you are facing a so difficult reality in Brazil, this kind of event are so refreshing for us to have the opportunity to, to talk and to change with you. So thank you so much. Ich glaube, den Dank können wir nur an dich, Jamila, und dich, Vanessa, zurückgeben. Ähm, Vanessa, wenn du möchtest, hast du jetzt natürlich auch noch einmal das Wort für eine letzte Ergänzung, aber es ist ein kurzes. Und äh, dann gehen wir zum Ende über. I believe that what Jamila has already said about the feminist conferences, I believe that's something I find very important, what would it mean to create new transnational dimensions and post-colonial international, think in post-colonial internationalism, in particular in, in climate, uh, fights for the climate, And in, in particular, in terms of like who's speaking, it's really important to show the, to, to create um, connections and reactivate global connections. And I believe there's movements who do this already, especially self-organized refugee movements who show, or movements against uh, war, nation state, especially in the feminist movement, who show the international intersectionality of violence, but also climate uh, change, what kind of role it plays. We already have this intersectionality, the, this, this intersectionality within these fights. And I believe this means more than just listening to This is, we need to, what does it mean to marry, marry your thoughts, I'm sorry, not to just follow them, but what does it mean to form a radical engagement and sabotage with the form of production. This is something that I find very important. This international dimension and also the, the question of translation and interpreting. Thank you very much for this, for this conversation and for the organization and that I could take part in this meeting. I also want to thank you. I find it very interesting chat. There has been many there has been a comment with food for the thought. This is what I'd like to conclude with. Thank you very, very much on both of you in particular for your inputs and for the very interesting discussion. And how this brings together the locality. I would like to thank, uh, thanks a lot to everyone who um, I've listened to this talk and especially thank you to the Enterprise and to Andrea Schul from um, EF, from Medico Internacional, the known the EFS team on public noise for the technical support. And I conclude 
with um with a reminder for the next meetings on the 13th of december there's a discussion on structural consequences of patriarchal violence in the same week on the 16th of december it uh, will be the first first talk that couldn't take place we're very we're looking forward if you you will be able to take part and wish you a nice evening thank you very much <laughs>